Is Christ sufficient? Is he enough for you? Is he alone really able to completely deal with your sins and to save you? These are the seeds of doubt that the false teachers in Colossians were whispering in the ears in the church. And there's been a lot of ink spilt by commentators to try to figure out exactly what the heresy in Colossians was that Paul is addressing. And one commentator actually mentioned that there's over 44 different views of what this heresy actually is. And I'm here tonight to tell you which one's the right one. So in all reality, we don't really know exactly what the heresy was all about. We do have some specifics given to us in chapter 2, verses 16 to 23 that Colton's going to go over for us. And the things that we do know is that, number one, there was a strong Jewish element. And we know that because things like circumcision is mentioned, things like keeping the Sabbaths and festivals and food regulations, those are all mentioned. There's also a big pagan mystical element. We know that because the worship of angels is mentioned and visions and things of that nature. And we also know that there was an aesthetic element, which is the severe discipline of the body. So those are the things we know about the heresy. And to, to say a lot more about that is really a lot of speculation. But really what it all boils down to is that the false teachers were trying to convince the believers that Christ was not supreme and therefore he wasn't sufficient to deal with their sins and that they needed more, that they needed to add to Christ. And as Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, really, this is the same temptation that Eve had in the garden, wasn't it? I mean, the serpent went to Eve and said, just, just eat this apple and then you'll be content. Then you'll become like God yourself and you won't need God. And we're bombarded on a daily basis with every decision that we make that Christ isn't enough. And we're told that we're addicts, not drunkards. We become discontent and depressed and we're told to medicate ourselves. Stay-at-home moms are told that they are of no value because they don't contribute anything to society. Men are judged by what profession they have and by how much money they make. We're told that if you're not happy in your marriage, just leave your spouse. Find somebody that will make you happy. So let me ask you again, is Christ sufficient? Is he enough for you? And these are the questions that Paul is going to answer for us today. And in verse 8, Paul gives us his charge. And he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elemental principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. The phrase, see to it here, it, is, it gives the idea of a continual, constant watchfulness. And then the next phrase, takes you captive, it has the idea of being carried away as, as if somebody conquered you and took you away as spoil, or as a pirate with his booty. So what Paul is saying here is that you need to always be watching out and always be on the defense from false teachers tickling your ears because if you stop, even for a moment, you're going to be carried away by their false philosophy. And philosophy, that's not really necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the word really just means a love of wisdom. And James 1.5 tells us that we need to even be asking God for wisdom. But look at how verse 8 defines the false teacher's wisdom. It says, according to the tradition of men, according to the elemental principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So there's a, there's a very distinct contrast made between the false philosophy of the false teachers and the true philosophy or wisdom of Christ. <clears throat> its origin is human and, not, and earthly as opposed to divine and heavenly. This isn't godly wisdom, it's man-centered, and it's empty, and there's no substance in it. And in combating this empty philosophy, something that I notice in studying is Paul isn't, he's not nearly as harsh with the Colossians as he was in Galatians. Like, if you read through Galatians, or in Galatians, you will notice that he's, he uses pretty harsh language there, and he even rebukes Peter publicly because he was essentially allowing 
the, the law to be added to Christ in Galatians. But he, he doesn't use such strong language here in Colossians. And so what that tells me is that the church hasn't given in to these false teachers. They're persevering, but they're wavering. They're much like a boxer who's just taking blow after blow and they're growing weary. And Paul's concern is that they are losing confidence in the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ for their salvation. And Paul is giving the church a booster shot designed to inject greater assurance in their faith and hope in Christ so that they continue to persevere. And something I, I want to clarify here is when we talk about salvation, we typically think about our justification, right? The moment that we profess faith in Christ, that's the moment we're saved is what we typically think. But that's just when our salvation begins. And that's when our sanctification starts, the process of putting off our old man and putting on the new man in Christ, which Colossians 3 talks about. And then after that, once we die or Christ comes back, we're then glorified and our salvation is completed. So our salvation, it's something that happens at a moment in time, but it has ongoing results. And so when we're talking here in Colossians about how they're struggling and they're being tempted to trust in other things than Christ for their salvation, we're talking about the daily grind, the daily putting off of the old man and putting on the new man in Christ. So we need to keep that in mind as we're going through this. So what we're going to see here in Colossians 2, 8 to 15, is that Paul gives us four motivating truths that Christ is completely sufficient for our sins to keep us from being taken captive by false teaching. Paul gives us four motivating truths that Christ is completely sufficient for our sins to keep us from being taken captive by false teaching. And the first motivating truth in it is in verses 9 to 10, and that is our completeness is in Christ. Our completeness is in Christ. Verse 9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So this phrase here, in him, or with him, or through Christ, you're going to see different variations of this phrase all throughout our passage tonight. And it's actually used 22 times in the book of Colossians, and it's used nine times in chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. So if God is saying something once, it's important, right? If he says it nine times in a few verses, you know, our, our ears, they really need to perk up because there's a truth that God is trying to communicate to us here that he wants us to get. We need to make sure we don't miss it. And that truth is that every truth that we're going to talk about tonight, it is rooted in our union with Christ. And without this union, we are hopeless. We are without God. And we are what verse 13 describes us as. And that we'll talk about in a moment. So as Paul goes through these motivating truths, he's going to make it abundantly clear that our sufficiency is found in this union. So the next phrase in verse 9, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So this statement, it's very similar to what was said in chapter 1, verse 19, but there's a distinct difference here. Paul further qualifies where God's deity resides, and that's in Christ's physical body. And the word dwells here, it's Old Testament temple language, and this wouldn't have been missed by his audience. So the point that Paul is making here is that the focal point of worship and of God's presence, it's now permanently shifted from the temple to Christ. And this would have been a nice dagger to the Jewish element that the false teachers were peddling. I mean, Jesus is the God-man. He's 100% God and 100% man. And as such, he is completely sufficient to deal with our sins, as nothing else could. And because of this fullness, Christ is head over the rules and authority that it mentions at the end of verse 10. And the, the rest of how this happens, how he is the head over these authorities, it's going to be fleshed out as we go along. But notice the next phrase in verse 10. It says, in him you have been made complete. This, complete, this completeness is also going to be defined in the rest of our passage today. But notice that when we put our faith in the perfect God-man, we too experience the same fullness or completeness through his fullness. 
John 1.16 says, For of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Ephesians 1.3 says, We now have every spiritual blessing in Christ. So in Christ, in this union, we have everything we need to deal with our sins. And the following three truths, they will show us about how exactly we are made complete in Christ. So the first motivating truth is that Christ's sufficiency, the first, first motivating truth of Christ's sufficiency is that our completeness is in Christ. The second motivating truth is that we have a complete salvation in Christ. We have a complete salvation in Christ. And that's in verses 11 to 12. So verse 11, in him, you, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So the first phrase, in him, notice that phrase again. You were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And we don't know for sure, but it's probable, a little speculation here, that circumcision was one of those elements that the false teachers were teaching that you needed to have in order to be saved, in order to be part of God's covenant people. This is probable because we know that circumcision was a hot button topic in the early church. We know for sure in Galatians it was a massive issue and it was so big of an issue they actually had the first church council about it in Acts 15 where they decided that circumcision was no longer necessary because it was only a shadow of, of, what it, of what it was meant to be with Christ. So in the Old Testament, every baby boy had to be circumcised on the eighth day. <clears throat> and it was an outward sign that he belonged to the covenant people of Israel, of Abraham. And it was also an outward demonstration that man was born sinful and that he needed cleansing. It was a bloody, filthy picture of how bad our sin actually is and how desperately we need to have it removed. And ultimately, it points to the cross because that's the only thing that can truly cleanse our sins. This is what Moses talked about in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, when he says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of, his, of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. And we have example after example in the Old Testament of how Israel was a hard-hearted, stiff-necked, rebellious people. It didn't matter what sign God gave them. It didn't matter what provision he provided. They had a sinful heart that physical circumcision could never do anything about. In Christ, because of his work on the cross, all those who have put their faith in Jesus have now experienced this circumcision of the heart. <clears throat> and the next phrase in verse 11, it's actually going to describe what this circumcision of the heart actually is. And it says, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. One commentator explained it like this saying, by being in union with Christ, in his death you were circumcised by the hand of the Spirit, not by human hands in the flesh, by the stripping off of your old self, by the spiritual circumcision which Christ performs on those in union with him. So when we put our faith in Christ, he crucifies our old sinful nature. As Romans 6 says, we are no longer slaves to it, that is, that's what the removal of the body of the flesh means. He strips the chains off of us and he slays our old master. And that doesn't mean that our old sinful nature is immediately gone or that we immediately stop struggling with sin. It means that he has given us a heart that now loves God. A heart that when it recognizes sin, it hates sin and it desires to put it off as Colossians 3 talks about. You wouldn't have that desire unless Christ circumcised your heart. And nothing that the false teachers are offering can deal with their sins because only Christ can circumcise the heart. Moving on to verse 12, we have a participle here saying having been. And so that ties verse 12 to verse 11, which is connecting baptism with the circumcision of Christ. Christ. 
So this removal or stripping of our old nature that Christ does on the heart of a believer, it's accomplished through what baptism symbolizes. And really, verse 12, it needs to be read in light of Romans 6, 1 through 11. And in Romans, Paul's addressing the question of, well, if Christ has already paid the price for my sin, why does it matter if I continue to sin? And Paul lays out the argument that if you really are in Christ, if you have really put your faith and trust in him, then you have died to your old sinful, your old sin nature, and you've been risen to new life. You no longer identify with that old man. It was crucified with Christ. So through what baptism represents, Christ accomplished what Old Testament circumcision was only a picture of. So then notice the, the phrase in verse 12. It says, through faith in the working of God. And this describes the means by which Jesus performs this circumcision. So, so the stripping of our sin nature is accomplished by the work of Christ on the cross and our faith in the work that God has done. Notice something to note here is that Paul connects faith with works. But notice who he's connecting the works to. It's to God, right? It's not of ourselves. It's the work that God has done. So our salvation, along with the stripping of our sin nature, it's accomplished through Christ's work and not ours. And this would have spoken directly to the false teachers who were saying that they needed to add to Christ to deal with their sins. They needed to do something. So verses 13 and 14, we're going to see our third motivating truth. And that is, we have a complete forgiveness in Christ. We have a complete forgiveness in Christ. <clears throat> Verse 13, it's, it describes the circumstances in which the Colossians were found when God made them alive. And this is very similar language to that that was used in Ephesians chapter 2, which is probably my favorite passage in the Bible. And a few months ago, I taught about Ephesians 2 in the K-2 class, and the way, I, the way I tried to communicate the deep truths in Ephesians 2 to 5 to 7-year-olds is that I illustrated it with their favorite superhero movie. So think of your favorite superhero movie. Doesn't matter which one, every one of the plots are the same. So you have this villain and he's built up into this unstoppable force. He, he has this reign of terror. And you're, everybody's hopeless. And left to ask this question of who can stop this man? And then the superhero comes in with this super cool superhero landing. And then he proceeds to defeat the villain. <clears throat> I then proceeded to explain to the kids that this is what has actually happened to us. We were dead in our sins. We have an uncircumcised heart. I didn't use that phrase with the kids. So, and we are completely incapable of doing anything to please God. We are without God. We are without hope, doomed to an eternity in hell. But God, my, the two best words in the Bible, in my opinion, but God dropped in with the greatest superhero landing you can imagine. And he did what the false teacher's promises never could. He made them alive, throwing away their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh. And now being alive, they are now forgiven. And then moving on to verse 14, we have another participle which connects verse 14 to 13. So verse 14 is actually explaining how we receive this forgiveness. So verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So verse 14 here, it's describing and giving a complete list of what all we have been forgiven of. And Paul gives the imagery of a courtroom here in this verse. And the, the phrase certificate of debt has the idea of an IOU. And we're all familiar with an IOU. So you either buy a house or you buy a car and the bank gives you a loan. But in exchange, you are agreeing to pay back that loan to the bank. So whether you realize it or not, the simple fact that you were created, it implies that you were responsible to the creator. It's as if when you were created, you signed a contract with God 
where you were agreeing to obey, love, and honor him. And every time that you sin, it is evidence that you have broken that contract. And that contract is then hostile towards you, condemning you to hell. So I I want you all to picture this with me because Paul is giving great imagery here that I don't want us to miss. So you are in court and you're on trial. God the Father is the judge. You're up on the stand. And then Satan is the prosecuting attorney. Satan then holds up this contract to where he says that you have agreed to love, honor, and obey God. And then he proceeds to list out every sin that you have ever committed, and even sins that you didn't even know that you committed, as evidence against you. And you're just sitting there feeling the weight of this sin as he spends hours and days and months however long it would take to list out every sin that you have ever committed as evidence against you. And when he finishes, the father looks at you, asks you if you have any last words before he pronounces judgment, and you're just sitting there speechless, hopeless, looking the father in the eyes. And just as God is about to strike his gavel to send you to hell for all of eternity, your defense lawyer stands up, And it's Jesus. And he says, Father, my client is guilty, but I have evidence that his debt has been paid. He then shows the father the the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet from when the nails were driven. He shows him the, the scars on his forehead from when they pressed the crown of thorns onto his head. He shows them the scars on his back from the whipping that he took and the bruises from the beating. He tells the father, I took his sins and I nailed it to the cross. I paid his debt. I took it out of the way. The father then looks at you. He strikes his gavel and he pronounces you not innocent, but forgiven. How could whatever these false teachers were peddling even compare to the forgiveness offered through Christ? How could whatever you're tempted to trust in place of Christ even compare with this kind of forgiveness? He is more than sufficient to deal with our sins because we have a complete forgiveness in him. The fourth motivating truth that we see here is that we have a complete victory in Christ. That's in verse 15. We have a complete victory in Christ. So verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. There's that last use of that phrase, through him, at the end there. So verse 15 here, when it talks about the rulers and authorities, he's actually tying it back to verse 10 when he said that Christ is head over these rules and authority. And now he's showing us exactly how. So when Satan, along with the Jewish leaders, the Romans, and every other authority that's ever been against God, when they crucified Jesus, they thought that they were the victors. But then when Christ rose three days later, he rose victoriously. And so did we because of our union through Christ, with Christ. And when it says that Christ disarmed them, it has this, it has this idea of stripping away. So he didn't just disarm them. He stripped them along with every false philosophy that's ever existed completely naked of any power and any authority. And the phrase here, it says he made a public display of them. This is the same word used in Matthew 119 when it was referencing Joseph not desiring to disgrace Mary, but to divorce her quietly. But the difference here is that Christ wants to expose these false teachers for the fraudulent authorities that they are. And he wants to do it so that all can see. And the imagery Paul uses here is that of a 
Roman custom of awarding victorious generals a victory parade. So when a, a, when a Roman general conquered an army, they would lead a massive victory parade through the city in which the general would ride through in splendor throughout the city with his defeated captives following in chains from the successful campaign. And we're all familiar with the parades that the, the chiefs have experienced with their recent history, right? We've seen the city just shut down completely. Schools canceled, people take off work. It's a big deal. I mean, that's, that's just a glimpse of what these Roman parades would be, let alone what Christ's triumphal procession will look like. Through Christ, through the cross, Christ triumphed over every rule and authority, over every empty philosophy and anything that has ever stood against God. And the truth here is that this isn't just Christ's victory. It's our victory through our union with Christ. <clears throat> so none of these powers have any authority over us either because we are in Christ. So in conclusion, let me ask you one last time. Is Christ sufficient? Is he enough for you? <clears throat> Is he really enough to completely deal with your sin? And to be honest, as, as we've gone through this, this passage, I haven't really loved using the word sufficient because Christ, he, he isn't just sufficient. Sufficient in my mind is he's good enough. But Christ isn't good enough. He perfectly deals with our sin. And we've seen that in the four motivating truths that Christ is sufficient for our sins to keep us from being taken captive by false teaching. We've seen that our completeness is in Christ. We have a complete salvation in Christ. We have a complete forgiveness in Christ. And we have a complete victory in Christ. So what lies are tempting you not to trust Christ alone to be sufficient? Is it self-worth or self-image? Worrying about what other people think of you rather than finding your value in Christ? Are you in a season of discontentedness and rather than finding your content in Christ, you're trying to change your circumstances? Are you, trying, are you trusting in your own works rather than the working of God that we looked at tonight? Have you picked up on the theme that the solution to resisting the lies that we hear in our culture is our union in Christ? It's in him that we are complete. It's in him that we have salvation. It's in him that we have forgiveness. It's in him that we have victory. And Colossians 3, 3 through 4 says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Christ isn't just part of our lives. He is our life. Without him, we're back to verse 13. We're without God. We're without hope. So Christian, persevere. Whatever sin, struggle, or hardship you're experiencing right now, Christ is enough. He's more than enough. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Colossians. Lord, we thank you for what we learned in this book, that you are supreme and therefore you are sufficient to deal with our sins, Father, and for our salvation and for our daily struggle with sin, to put off the old man and to put on the new man, Father. And I pray that tonight, just as Paul desired to inject greater assurance and hope and motivation in the Colossians to keep persevering, that we would have that same hope in you tonight through our union in you that we would continue to persevere, that whatever sin that we're struggling with, that we would turn to you to deal with that sin and nothing else, Father. And Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for what your son has done for us, what he has accomplished for us, the working that you have done that we've looked at tonight. And Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name.